Uh, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Um, in previous ones, I talked about different opposition, like stuff at work, and then I talked about the one message that was, I think, really important. It was the, by the, um, the one save, the always safe thing, and I had a glitch, and the whole tape was gone. I had to re-record that. So this week, the obstacle was early Saturday morning, the entire sermon, I deleted it. So um, it's kind of funny because the message is where Jesus in the storm, so it's about going through storms in life and how storms are inevitable. But of course, my reaction to deleting the sermon was just to act like a big baby and want to say, oh, I'll just put it off, or I don't even know why I do this at all, I'll just quit, nobody wants to come, no one wants to do it's a waste of time. So I just kind of act like a big baby, which is kind of goofy. Because the message is really like, hey, if it gets deleted, what do you do? You just start over. Start from the beginning. So that, that's it. Um, so I'm looking at the reason for the stuff deleted is either devil's opposition, or it could be that the Holy Spirit, God didn't want me to be so locked into what I wrote. He wanted me to kind of just free flow with it, which I'm going to do a little more tonight, kind of just talk more from the heart. Um, or it's just the fact that I'm an idiot. Or as we'll find from the message is that uh, probably it's, Everything combined. That's probably what's going on. It's everything simultaneously. So I'll say a prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, uh, since this is a very important message, it's really the biggest objection to you um, with the thing that atheists throw out. So I ask, since I am an idiot, that you come and you speak through me and you get your message to the people that need to hear it and you uh, really open up their eyes and you explain to them where your son is, where you are in the storm. All right, so we'll go right to... Matthew 8. It's not working now. No move. It worked. All right. So it says, verse 23, And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and awoke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey? All right, so we're going to set the scene. God, it's work. The Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. Now, the Golan Heights, which is also called, we'll hear later, uh, the Decapolis. That is actually 2,500 feet above sea level. So what you have in the Sea of Galilee, kind of say the hill, hill, is like a basin, it's like a bowl. So in the fall, when the winds come, you get crazy, crazy storms on the Sea of Galilee. So this is like pretty scary stuff you hear, like, like waves swimming all over the place. <clears throat> also, set the scene, if you haven't seen Matthew 4, when I talk about temptation, how Jesus is not only fully God, He's also fully man. It's probably good to go back and watch because it really gives you the full drama of what's going on, the pathos, the real emotion. But it's a very real sacrifice. Jesus feels very real pain. And since He's a man, He's a very real example to us. So Hebrews 2, 14-18, it describes as, Since the children had flesh and blood, He too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by both their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. All right. So now we know that Jesus is fully man, not just God. In the previous chapter, he does a series of healings. He's healing people left and right. And it's not just magic. It actually takes a physical toll on his body. That's why he tells people, don't tell everyone yet, because this is crowds came and sworn him, it's exhausting. He, a lot of times he actually tries to get away from the crowds and go out to the wilderness just to get some peace and recuperate. So when you have this thing where he's sleeping in the boat, a lot of preachers talk about it, just his supreme confidence, 
but I don't necessarily think it's confidence. I think it's really just exhaustion. The reason I think it's exhaustion says, and when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. So the boat was being swamped by waves, but he fell asleep. So even if he's confident, I just think it's too annoying. If you've ever been on the sea with waves crashing in and wetting you and you're flipping to and fro, you have to be really tired. The guys have been in the military or you're exhausted, you've been up for a couple days, you can sleep through just about anything. So I think it was just really physical exhaustion. Now, remember, these guys are professional fishermen. So they're familiar with these conditions. This is their home area. Um, but it's so rough, they're afraid they're going to die. Verse 25 says, And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? He rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? Now remember, just prior to this, Jesus encountered a Roman pagan centurion. And to this Roman centurion, who's like not Jewish, doesn't understand the scriptures and stuff, he tells him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So now, shortly afterwards, he's with his disciples who ate with him, drank with him, slept with him. They're living under the same roof. They're working together. And to these guys who knew him better than anyone, he says, Why are you afraid? Oh, you of such little faith. So then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And when the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now, Matthew likes to use the Socratic method. Jesus uses it a lot as well. What's the Socratic method? Basically, means instead of just lecturing and telling you what you need to know, he asks kind of obvious questions, lets you work it out for yourself, but the answer is really obvious. Like, you don't have to be Jewish to know what kind of man would the winds and sea obey. Like, he clearly is the Son of God. Now, if you are Jewish, it has an even more special meaning. Most important story to the Jews is the story of the Exodus. So in the Exodus, when they're in Egypt, God does a, God does a series of different miracles. The, we call them the plagues. The Bible really calls them signs and wonders. Each one was geared towards a specific God in Egypt. And a lot of the tricks Moses did, the uh, Egyptian magicians could duplicate to some extent. So there was like satanic magic and forces at work. Um, but the grand finale, the coup de grace, the one thing that just said, this is clearly the God of all gods, he's beyond anything we can imagine, is when he splits the Red Sea. So in other words, even the winds and the seas obey him. Now, if these guys really know their Bible and are really good with Scripture, they would know Psalm 107. Verses 23 to 32, which is basically just a prophecy of this event here. It says, Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, His wondrous works in the deep. For He commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He made the storm still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and He brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. All right. So the disciples felt abandoned at that moment when they're in the midst of the storm. So despite everything they saw, all the miracles they saw Jesus that he did, they still didn't trust him. And trust is the essence of faith. Faith isn't about intellectual assent. It's not about believing facts. 
James 1, and we're going to kind of get into it later in this lesson. The demons know that Jesus is the Son of God, and they tremble, they shudder in fear, but they don't have saving faith because they don't trust in Him, they don't follow Him. So what it really comes down to, the vast majority of people in the world are what I call functional atheists. They profess that they believe there's a God, but they act like there really isn't. Now, ironically, the people who do the circuit speaking tour and act, say they proclaim they are atheists, they're the complete opposite. They proclaim they don't believe in God, but are obsessed with Him and prove that they really do believe in God. They're like a scorned girlfriend. Their issue isn't that they don't believe God's real. It's, there's so much evidence around us. If something is created, it has a creator. What they really is, they hate God. Not that they don't believe Him. So what they use, this is probably the most popular argument against God. It's very basic. What atheists will try to throw out there is that if God is all-powerful, and God is all good, then there couldn't possibly be suffering in the world. Because an all good God wouldn't allow anyone to suffer. Now, we look out in the world and what do we see? We see suffering. So they postulate that since we see suffering, God is either not good, and that's the argument you have. Christopher Hitchens, his book is God is Not Great. That's the argument he likes to throw out there, that God's not really good. So he kind of acknowledges God probably, or he kind of confesses that he just doesn't like him. Um, or this other argument that he's not all-powerful. Now, unfortunately, the argument that he's not all-powerful, I see that made more by Christians than I actually see made by atheists. Uh, in an effort to preserve his character and defend God and to show he's all-loving, a lot of Christians will let go of his absolute sovereignty. They won't acknowledge that he's in control of all things. And they use little things like to say, well, um, he allows suffering. But he doesn't cause it. Like, oh, he's not the author of, of any evil. He allows it. Well, if he's ultimate sovereign, what really is the difference between allowing and causing? If you... Uh, can save someone from drowning and stay there a while and don't, are you less culpable than the person that pushed him in the pool? Not really. So an ultimate sovereign God would be just as guilty for allowing suffering, if that's your argument, as one who actually caused it. So without getting too deep, we'll just go back into the psalm we just read. Right. So according to the psalm we just read, who calm the raging seas? It says, they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He made the storm still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. So all Christians will gravitate to that, yes. The Lord calmed the raging seas. Who stirred them up in the first place? Wow, look at that. For He commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. Hmm, interesting. But what's the proper response to all this, to the complete picture? It says, Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol Him in the congregation of the people and praise Him in the assembly of elders. So what's the problem with this argument? First off, this argument assumes there is such a thing as objective good. If there is such a thing as good that you're judging God by, you have to assume there is an objective right and wrong or is such a thing as good. If there's such a thing as objective good, an ultimate objective lawmaker had to make that, and the lawmaker is God. So by you assuming there is such a thing as good, you are assuming there is such a thing as a God. So they're not really saying he's not good. They're saying he does stuff I don't like. Uh, secondly, they're also assuming that they have some kind of divine omnipotence. That the person making the argument knows all the possible outcomes, all the possible universes, all the possible different ways things could happen. And their plan's better than this. 
They just don't like his point. But Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my, this is God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Right. So, these guys here, what they're proving is only that there's no such thing as a Santa Claus in the sky who just makes everyone happy and makes all their wishes and dreams come true. So according to that, okay, yes, we agree. Your made up imagined God does not exist. We both agree. So the real question is, is the God who's described in Scripture, does that God match what we see in reality? And we do. This is not a question that the Bible avoids. It's a question that the Bible answers repeatedly. Why is there suffering in the world? Why does God allow or cause people to suffer? And it's addressed in the book of Job. It's not only addressed in the book of Job, it's the whole point of the book of Job. So, in the very beginning of the book of Job, chapter 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Job is such a cool character that God actually brags to the devil about him. Like, like Job, at this point, is God's man. Like he's, that's his boy. He likes Job a lot. So the devil's response to God is, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So, uh, this time Job's blessed. He's rich, wealthy, has everything you would desire. And Satan goes out and takes it away from him. Now, what's important to note here, Satan is allowed to affect Job's circumstances. But he can't touch Job himself. Basically, if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, God's not into timeshares, so he's not going to share you with a demon. Demons can't jump inside people that are indwelled by God. So Satan can affect your circumstances, but he has no real power over you. Now, in uh, modern monster movies, the demons, basically, that's what all monsters pretty much are in movies. It's just a modern telling of, of uh, this mythos. The demons just attack people at random and tear apart innocent people and good people and they can do whatever they want. Now, when Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, we still had a biblical worldview. So you have things there, like a lot of Bible quotes, like the blood is the life. Like it's, very, it's actually very biblical. So Dracula, who represents Satan, he doesn't just attack his victims. What does he do? He seduces them. He seduces them with promises of power. He seduces them with promises of sensuality. Even though all along he doesn't want to give them any of that, his desire is just to devour them, just like the devil. So that's what he represents. And most importantly, how's Dracula defeat him? He runs from the cross, and he's destroyed you, bring him into the light of the sun. So there's a little play on words there. Right. So Job loses everything. He loses his wealth. He loses his health. He loses his family. And most importantly, he loses his reputation. So, I mean, this is, when I went through, I didn't remember how long the book of Job is. There's just like chapter and chapter and chapter of his friends, these amateur theologians, trying to explain like why it's happening. They're blaming Job. And Job's um, really in absolute frustration finally breaks and he cries out to God. He just says, like, you know, what, what is going on? Why are you doing this to me? I'm a righteous man. Like, why is this happening? Now, what's really interesting in our scriptures, which makes it different from any other holy book, you are allowed to cry out in frustration to God. You are allowed, to some extent, to yell at God. Moses does it. 
If you read the Psalms, that's pretty much most of what the Psalms are that David writes. And here in the book of Job, you have Job crying out to God. Now, can you imagine yelling, a Muslim yelling at Allah, questioning what he's doing? Doesn't happen. Even in like the pagan, like Indian gods, they're completely aloof. They couldn't care less what goes on with man. They can't relate to man at all. Yet, in back in the book of Hebrews again, uh, chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, it says, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. But we have one who is tempted in every way that we are, yet it was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Right. So God is described as a loving Father. He will patiently endure our accusations of Him. Um, but that doesn't mean He's not going to set us straight. And that's pretty much what He does with Job. When we get to chapter 38. God finally answers Job after Job's complaining and complaining. He says, The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you will make it known to me. Now, I'm going to start using this term because I, it's awesome. He says, Dress for action like a man. So if you want the literal translation, it says, Gird up your loins. So back then you took your basically your robe, and you like tied it down when you were getting ready to fight, so you gird up your loins. The 2016 Ed Kisselback translation of Dress for Action Like a Man is, put on your big boy panties, son. You want to go? We're going to go. So that's basically what God is saying to Job. So, what's it? Dress for Action Like a Man. What did I say, 2016? I know I would. All right, I will question you and make it known to me. He says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So then God goes on for several chapters describing all his incredible, miraculous creations from like the tiniest creatures to the entire span of the cosmos. What's especially interesting, he describes two creatures, the Leviathan and the Behemoth, that do not match a single thing that lives today, but match to a T, dinosaurs. He describes dinosaurs explicitly in, in Scripture as part of the wonders he created, but... It's, I don't know what else it would be because it doesn't describe anything I've ever seen other than watching Jurassic Park. So, you know, that's in there. And then he concludes it with Job, verse uh, 42. He says, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer. Right. So, there's two important things to note in the conclusion of Job in the very last chapter. The first is, God knew what his plan was all along. At the end, not only did he give back to Job everything he had, he doubled it. So he had blessings in mind for Job that Job could never possibly imagine. There's another important thing. Now, for those people that want to make this differentiation to make them feel better between allowing and ordaining, Chapter 1, who does it say is going to assault and accost and trouble Job? Satan. Now we get to the final chapter. Remember, this book is not like an anti-God book. This whole book of Job is praising God, and it's all about his sovereignty. Job's friends showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. So the book of Job, although it praises God, says God is in control all along. But he has blessings in mind for you that you can't comprehend right now. So your response is either anger or trust. So that's the message. You should have trust. You also find out that the devil might be our enemy, but in the end he's just a mere pawn of God. The devil fights against God's plan, but he still manages to seek 
to uh, fulfill God's secret plan. All right. So even though God has planned blessings beyond his imagination, God's not like parents today. All right. So, God didn't feel he needed to explain himself to Job in the midst of his fit. Before he was going to bless Job, he needed to reestablish what exactly the parameters of their relationship are. Now, I talked about Christopher Hitchens' book, so God is not great, because it demonstrates how atheists aren't really non-believers, they're just, they're just angry at God. Well, ironically, his brother, who was Peter Hitchens, wrote kind of an answer to that, and the title of his book is The Rage Against God, How Atheism Led Me to Faith. So his brother became a believer like, through this whole thing by realizing it's just really hate, hatred towards God. So, if your child is doing this, if they're like, ah, like yelling at you and screaming and they don't like your plan, do you like quietly, nicely explain to them like, why you're doing what you're doing? Well, if you read a lot of Dr. Spock books, you do. And if a whole generation of parents does that with a child, what we get is a whole generation of entitled millennials who act like a bunch of spoiled brats that don't really understand what their place is. Uh, the reality is you might not like it, but because I said so is the most important lesson for that child to learn at this point. Now think how comical it is when a child thinks they know more about how the world works than we do. Now I'm comparing a 10 year old to a 40 year old. Think how much funnier it is for a 40 year old to compare my knowledge of the world to an infinite God. It's insane. And not only does God have the infinity of experience to compare against my little tiny snippet of life, he's not just a watcher. He's the engineer who designed everything. He knows the end better than we can perceive our history and our present. So really, the lesson he says first is, I'm the father, you're the son, you're dependent upon me. That's the first lesson. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's in a whole bunch of different Proverbs. If you wait till you perfectly understand to obey, you're never going to obey because you're never going to understand. You have to follow first. And when you follow in your submission, then he will give you understanding. Um, the atheists, they'll never come to understanding. Because you have to obey first. Now, although because I said so is more than adequate, if my kids are calm afterwards and they want to actually seek wisdom, then I will share with them wisdom. I will tell you that this is why I did what I did. So that's what God does, and through James, Peter, and Paul, we get the deeper why. So with James it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Just such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, having stood the test that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Problem of Pain, 
If this is an issue for you, like what we're talking about today, I advise you get that. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I kind of really call more of a Christian philosopher than a theologian, um, but he addresses it really well. What's interesting is after he wrote this, that's when his wife went through cancer, and everything he wrote he kind of threw away, because <laughs> when he had to actually live it, it's a different story, but then he came back. So he says, <clears throat> we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse the deaf world. The problem of reconciling human suffering with the existence of a God who loves is only insoluble so long as we attach a trivial meaning to the word love and look on things as if man were the center of it. Man is not the center. God does not exist for the sake of man. Man does not exist for his own sake. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were created. We were made not primarily that we may love God, though we were made for that too, but that God may love us, that we may become objects in which the divine love may rest well pleased. Now, why did that Peter? He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fire ordeal which has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. All right, so I was going to read, uh, you'd be happy, Paul, if you want to follow Romans 5 and Romans 8, Paul gets into this whole thing. But instead of reading Paul, I'll make it a little more personal. Now, my wife had a uh, pretty bad upbringing. You could say she could have been like a reoccurring guest on the Jerry Springer show, we bring her on like once a week to tell like a different story. Um, <clears throat> now, if I go on a time machine and go back and change all that, would I? No. Like, well, why would you do that? Don't you love her? Like, don't you want her to be happy? Well, it's the fact that I love her is why I wouldn't change anything. Because her life experience made her exactly who she is today. Um, so when Jesus appeared to his disciples in the upper room, he told Thomas, put your hands in my, the nail marks in my, in my hand, and put your finger in my side. Now Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. So we know that when Jesus came, um, he was in his new perfected body. He's in the type of body that we will have in our resurrection. He's able to do like all sorts of really neat miraculous stuff like walk through walls and fly and appear and disappear and all that sort of stuff. So, but even though he's in his new perfect body, he still has scars. I think God sees scars differently than we do. We think our scars are a sign of weakness or <clears throat> uh, they represent pain. But to God, they show part of what his complete our perfected selves. God made us, us together in the womb. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just walk away after we were born. He's continuing to mold us into who he wants us to be. And who he wants us to be is conformed to the image of his son. So guess what? That often entitles scholars. Comes with the scholars. So the storm didn't come upon the disciples because Jesus was asleep at the wheel. They weren't being tossed around because he doesn't care. The storm came upon them so that he could teach them to have faith. To have the same faith in him that the centurion did. So they crossed to go over to the east side. And that's where we pick up verse 28. It says, And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. 
And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to tor torment us before the time? All right, so demons acknowledge the authority of Christ. Uh, they know that they are eventually going to lose on the last day. It's not a shocker to them. It says, Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. All right, so the area we're talking about is the Decapolis. It is uh, Deca, it's 10. It's 10 cities. Nine of them are on the east of the Sea of Galilee. We know they're Gentile cities because there's a herd of pigs there. They're pig farmers, so they're obviously not Orthodox Jews. So they're either Gentiles or Jews that just really don't care about what the Bible says because they're, they're making their money off of pigs. Um, it says, And the demons begged him, saying, If you kiss us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Uh, so you have either two conclusions. The first could be that animals, well, maybe three, animals can't even deal with having a demon in them. They're just not uh, developed enough. It freaks them out. Two, they know inherently that being dead is better than being possessed by a demon. I'm going to kind of go with three. That demons, when they're in you, possession itself is just naturally self-destructive. There's something about having demons in you that demons hate people. And if they're in you, they try to destroy you from the inside. Um, says that, verse 33, The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So, just be one. <laughs> I'll read it again. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed man. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Now, so we'll get into that later. Mark and Luke, they tell the story as well. So I'm going to get a little more detail, so I'm going to jump over to Mark. Mark chapter 5 says, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Now, if there's cops in here, this is starting to sound a little familiar. It's starting to sound a little curious. Like, hmm. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So we have an epidemic of cutters today. Is it spiritual? I would say yes. I'll get into later. We define everything as psychological now, which really is spiritual struggle. Verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, now it says he, and he knows the shift. Um, Matthew said there's two guys, Mark and Luke, only refer to one. Oh, see, there's a contradiction in Scripture. There's no contradiction. If I tell you I saw Kimberly yesterday, and she said blah, blah, blah. And Stacy says, we saw Kimberly and John yesterday, and they said, da, da, da. we're staying the same story. I'm just focusing on the one as the main aspect of the story. The other one just gives you more details. There's no contradiction if you're focusing on one or you happen to mention that, yes, there were two present. So, um, so when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. It's kind of scary. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd was about 2,000 in number. So we get extra detail here. That's a pretty big herd. They rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. 
Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, <clears throat> the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Ah. So, we get most of our information about demonic possession basically from this movie, from The Exorcist. Um, obviously, it's fiction, but I gotta say, William Peter Blatty definitely did his homework. And the story is based on a documented real event with a, it's a, it's a boy in a real life story. Now, in the movie, and I think in the real event, Reagan becomes possessed when she's playing with, does everyone know? Play with a Ouija board. Uh, so she's contacting the demonic world. Now, the truth in this is demonic possession is a, starts out as a voluntary event. Starts out with consent. Now, we go back to that Dracula slide that I showed earlier. Um, demons do still possess people today, but they don't like just pounce on innocent people. Uh, there has to be some cooperation. For most people, their only exposure to demonic possession would be watching movies like this. Um, but it, it's still very real in the world today, especially in third world nations. I talked to a friend who's a medical doctor. He went back to India and he said, there's, he's not even a Christian believer, but he flat says, like, no, there's demonically possessed people in India. Like, it's just like you see in the movies. Um, I would say, not only is it in our world, I would say it's actually more prevalent in the West. The only issue is in third worlds, they still use what we would consider medieval language and they still prefer things in spiritual aspects. In the West, we shun them. We're technological. We're very materialistic. We only refer to things in psychological terms, in medical terms. We don't talk in terms of spiritual possession. It sounds insane to us. So we give it a different name. See if people go where I'm, uh, follow where I'm tracking. Let's go through some synonyms for possession. Start with the definition. What is the definition of possession? To completely control, to be completely controlled by an evil spirit. Okay? So it's not long as we go through different synonyms. I come to addiction. Definition of addiction. Devotion and dependence upon an outside, mind-altering substance. <clears throat> Sounds like we're describing the same thing. If you don't think we are, what do we call intoxicants? What's our little euphemism for intoxicants? It's easy. In Pennsylvania, we have wine and spirits shops. Okay? Think I'm pushing this analogy too far? I don't know. We'll take it to the book. The Greek word pharmakia appears five times in the New Testament. You want to write them down? It's Galatians 5.20, Revelation 9.21, 18.23, 21.8, and 22.15. <clears throat> I don't think it's an irony that Revelation, which talks about the end times, is the one that mentions pharmakia the most. So I don't think there's, I mean, if there's going to be a bunch of uh, sorcery and witchcraft in the last days, I don't know. This would be a lot of drug use, probably. So what's the English word that sounds like pharmacia? Pharmacy. Why? Because it's the same word. It's, it's not even like, it's a transliteration more than a translation. Uh, pharmacia, the actual definition is, I believe here, it's basically to administer drugs. Um, think of how witches are always portrayed in all our stories. The way they do magic throughout all the old stories, not new nonsense, but all the old stories, which is kind of based on things these people were experiencing. 
They make magic potions. They put different combinations of things. They make someone drink it. When they drink this magic potion, they come under the possession and dominance of evil spirits. So it's pharmacy. Um, so let's look at a modern witch doctor. In the 1960s, we have Timothy Leary. He was a clinical psychologist at Harvard University. He experimented with different hallucinogens with his goal being that we would release our spirit and be able to contact higher levels of consciousness. So basically contact the spirit world. Now when he found his League of Spiritual Discovery, cute little words, LSD, ah, oh, you're so funny. So his League of Spiritual Discovery, granted, it was mostly so he could get away with possessing drugs legally under a First Amendment you say, oh, it's our religion, so that's why you could possess drugs legally. Uh, didn't actually work. But we can't ignore the satanic aspects of what they were actually doing. They would take LSD as a holy sacrament in this, this church, do tantric meditation, um, use little hypnotism tricks, and all these other different rituals that he got from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Now, uh, in his book, in the LSD and the American Dream, Timothy Leary writes, we saw ourselves as anthropologists from the 21st century and having a time module set somewhere in the dark ages of the 1960s. On this space colony, we were attempting to create a new paganism and a new dedication to life as art. So, he saw himself as basically a prophet who's bringing on a new age of paganism, or at least the dawning of the age of Aquarius. So, had major impact major ramifications on our culture and although the over um, aspects, the religious aspects of drug culture have faded away and have pretty much gone to the side narcotic possession is worse than it's ever been so let's compare what we see on the streets with what we see in the gospel the demoniacs were outcasts they're forced to live outside the city to live in tombs. Well, these guys don't live in tombs per se, but they live in the dead parts of the city. They live in flop houses in Kenyans. So they're basically the same thing. They're living in tombs. They give up everything that they love. Give up their family, their job, their hobbies, their talents, and their physical appearance, everything. Um, they move away from civilization and they live among dirty pigs, swamp. Um, now the pictures, I showed before the heroin junkies nodding off. They're pretty easy to arrest. I mean, as an officer, I guess for my own safety, if you guys were to pick a drug, we prefer to be heroin because all we really do with them now is resurrect them all the time. Uh, they're too dead to really fight. But if you've ever dealt with someone on PCP or a hallucinogenic stimulant, sounds exactly like verse 5. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Right. So these demons beg Jesus not to send them into the abyss before the appointed time. So they know their inevitable future. Um, they know that they will one day go into hell which was created for Satan and his demons. It wasn't created for any people. But if you follow them, that's where you're going to go. They know they already lost. They lost at the cross. But what they want to do is drag as many of you into hell as they possibly can. Um, in Mark 9, we have a description of what hell would be like. Everyone knows about the eternal lake of fire and burning. He also talks about hell is a place where the worm dies not. So you're going to be forever consumed by worms, eaten alive forever in hell. Meth users, and I think they really have one foot in hell already, they describe the sensation of being eaten alive by bugs. There's bugs inside their skin, and they scratch and scratch and scratch at it to get the bugs out of their body. Um, I've seen wounds way worse than that. It looks like they were in a sword, like they're the crazy wide open wounds. It looks like they were in a sword fight. Like it's just, it's, uh, it, it's unbelievable who you actually see. Um, so it actually looks worse than this. Satan wants to drag us on to hell. 
They have a little taste, but we don't have to go. According to John 14, Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that would I... If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Galatians 5, verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and what? Pharmakia, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Alright, so we're confronted by the Lord of the universe. We know that it will result in a change in our life. Um, this is why we see two drastically different responses to this, these people on the Decapolis. The ones who were possessed, they already hit rock bottom. They know what hell is like, so they'll do anything to escape it. <clears throat> when Jesus comes and offers a change in their life, they cling at his feet and beg to be his disciple. And this perfectly explains why Christ allows storms in the lives of those he loves. <clears throat> this experience of hell drives addicts and people that have had terrible lives to long for the kingdom of heaven. Now conversely, compare that to the normal citizens who've had good lives. They also recognize the power of Jesus. They also recognize if I come to him, it's going to drastically change my life. But they like their lives. They're comfortable with their lives. They want to hold on to what they have. Even though hold on to what you have is just like a vapor. It's like trying to hold on to water. It's all going away anyway. But these people are more worried about their pigs, these filthy pigs, than they are about their future. They don't see a man who's free from the bondage of demons. They just see their income going out the window. So, the question is, what's your reaction today? You see Christ's power. He not only controls the spiritual world, where he can command demons to do things, he commands even the winds and the waves. He's in control of everything. So you can be like the demoniac, fall at his feet, and beg to be his disciple, or you'd be like the other citizens who are just more worried about holding on to their pigs. Um, does he need to send a storm into your life? And push you to the point where you're almost drowning for you to respond. Um, I know my choice. It's pretty easy. So I'll say, Dear Heavenly Father, I've had enough waves. I know your power. He says, You can take away my pigs and any other obstacles that I place between you and me. If there's any lingering demons who want to control my appetites, I ask you to cast them out, cast them away. He says, I recognize your authority. I know the fate of all those who, who follow Satan. I ask that you free me from my oppressors and make me your disciple. And then I will go out and tell everyone in the ten cities that surround me about this wonderful miracle you've done in my life. In Jesus' name, I pray.
Amen.